Welcome to Why We Do What We Do. I am your extraterrestrial host, Abraham. Ooh, and I am your unidentified host, Shane. Nice. We're a psychology podcast, and once a year, for the third time in a row now, we (laughs) set aside the month of October as a special time to celebrate the spooky psychology things in the world. Yes, and it is so spooky. It's some of our favorite things. I I forget how it came up, but we were like, we should do more spooky stuff because spooky is fun. Yeah. I also don't remember like what was the exact impetus for this, but uh, I'm glad that we're doing it now. So yeah, here we are talking about spooky things. And today's spooky thing is that we are talking about UAPs yeah, and all that stuff. Tom DeLonge was right. (laughs) Um, (laughs) If you enjoy the spooky things that we talk about and many of the other topics that we have covered in our nearly 300 episodes that we're coming up on here in not too long, because this is episode, I think, 283 or thereabouts. Yes. You can support us by doing some things. You can... Join us on Patreon. You can buy some merch. You can subscribe to our podcast. You can follow us on social media. You can open a charitable donation center where the proceeds go to supporting the podcast. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk more about all those things at the end of this episode today. But Shane, do you know what day that this episode comes out? I honestly don't. (laughs) (laughs) That's okay. It comes out October 12th. So we always release on Wednesdays and Oh, it's a good day. Yeah, uh, there's there's a few things that October 12th has been reserved for celebrating and one of those things it is National Emergency Nurses Day, which is awesome. Oh, yes, thank you for your work. What seems like a related topic is, is apparently also World Arthritis Day. Oh, yes, that sounds painful. It is an international top spinning day for those of you who are just double checking to make sure that you're not in inception. <laughs> yes, it is. Much appreciated. Find out you're not in the dream world. Great. That's right. Related to our last topic, which we did on the Voodoo Queen of New Orleans, is October 12th is National Gumbo Day. Oh, gumbo so good. I haven't had it in so long. It is also, I'm going I'm to give one more for the day. There's a lot, so I'm going to just give one more. It is National Pet Obesity Awareness Day. Oh, or, man, no. but fat dogs are so cute. <laughs> right? But the one I want to give for the month before we forget is that it is we're coming up now on the end of National Hispanic Heritage Month. It'll end on Saturday the 15th. So just know that that is going on. And then it's also still October's Mental Health Month and National Domestic Violence Awareness Month. It is also Canadian Library Month and the Computer Learning Month and Down Syndrome Awareness Month. Oh, nice. Yes. All good things. Interesting Canadian Library Awareness Month. Yeah. That's an interesting one. Now you're aware Canada has libraries too. (laughs) Yes. So you can celebrate some nurses by bringing them a care basket full of gumbo and tops and uh, maybe some pictures of fat pets. Yeah. You know, I was thinking for Canadian Library Month, there's probably a big A section. (laughs) (laughs) But (laughs) that was that was very well done. So dumb. That's it. This is the last episode of the podcast. We can't do any more. There's nothing that's going to top that joke. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. We, we maxed out. All right. Well, let's let's continue uh, for what time we do have left. Let's talk about some <laughs> some UFOs and UAPs. And what's interesting about this is the the idea of there being something like a UFO or a UAP has been intriguing for humans for some time. If you're paying attention at all to the sort of national discourse in the United States, a little bit internationally too. There is a resurgence in the popularity of this topic among people. Yeah. And so we're going to try to answer some questions. What are UFOs slash UAPs? How do you become a ufologist or ufologist or however you want to pronounce that? And we are also going to answer the question, what happens to a decaying body of an animal? Right. So, Shane, let's say you are walking down the street and you see that some poor animal has died for some reason. What would you expect its body to look like? I would expect it to have some open wounds, maybe. Uh, maybe okay. you could see some bones. You should see like okay. the the fur kind of falling off or deteriorating, and kind of the skin moving away, right? Like, and I would expect to see some maybe some insects around it consuming, or maybe even carrion birds. Okay. Very commonly, I think you tend to see that it no longer has eyes. Yes, is usually part of it, and that sort of thing. Yeah. So all that is uh, seems like a non sequitur. So just just. We're just going to talk about that's something you might see normal part part of the decaying process that those parts are missing and that it maybe has those like cuts or tears and that sort of thing. 
Yes. So anyway, let's move on from that discussion. Let's talk about a man <laughs> whose name is Kenneth Arnold. Ah, man with two first names. So he was born <laughs> on March 29th, 1915 in Minnesota, and he grew up in Montana, big sky country, which I hear is beautiful. And he started a company that sold and installed firefighting equipment. So in 1915, right. I imagine uh, it was just a lot of buckets. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's just a bucket manufacturer, really. <laughs> yeah. Maybe there was like a, a canvas blanket that was like, you could maybe throw this on a very small fire to try and uh, <laughs> snuff it out if you're quick yeah. enough. Yeah. So they're their two primary products. Anyway, after his company sold, he moved out West. He didn't go like all the way to the coast. He mostly ended up in Idaho, but at some point along the way in his journey through life, he decided, I really want to fly planes. Not professionally though, just for fun and like as a hobby. And so he became an amateur aviator as one does. <laughs> so I was going to say as one does. Now at some point in 1947, a Marine Corps C-42 transport plane crashed around Mount Rainier in Washington. And there was a reward of $5,000 for anyone who located the wreckage, which is the today's equivalent of $63,000. So sounds like an important plane. Yeah. And if you, if you look up an image of what a Marine Corps C-42 transport plane in 1947 would have looked like, it was pretty big. This is a fairly large plane. Looks like it had probably a couple of levels to it. It looks like it was meant to haul some fairly large equipment. And so something that they wanted, it went missing. Now, the morning of Tuesday, June 24th, 1947. I'm sure lots of people remember that day. Kenneth Arnold, you know, uh-huh. K.A. He gets out of bed in his Idaho home, yeah. maybe a little earlier than he needed to. So he has a little extra time because he has an agenda today. Yes, the skies are clear, there's a light breeze. He crawls into his Call Air A-2 to fly to an air show in Oregon. And on the way, he decides to fly near Mount Rainier to look for signs of that downed plane. And so when you look up his plane, it's like a little single engine, like kind of like a Cessna. It's very yeah. small. It's a very small right. plane. And I say that like, oh, it's a small plane. Like, I could not afford a plane, but, yeah. you know, here we are. You know, it's a small plane compared to what he's looking for. Yeah, it looks like a flying car. <laughs> because it's yeah. not terribly yeah. larger than like a pretty large car and it has wings. Yeah, exactly. Now, given the means and opportunity, we have to assume Arnold was looking for a nice payday. He finds signs of the down plane, gets a nice payout. Everybody's happy. Win-win. Yes. So anyway, as he's flying over Mineral Washington, which was at the time a logging and mining camp, although it has since become unincorporated, so kind of a ghost town. This town is a little southwest of Mount Rainier and a little southeast of Tacoma, Washington. So if you're, you can imagine he's basically flying between Tacoma and Mount Rainier, kind of in that area a little bit. He's a little bit south of both of them. Yeah. And as he's flying, he suddenly sees something unusual. Ooh, fun. So he reported a bright flash, kind of like when the sun reflects off of a mirror. Yeah. And then he saw nine more flashes. Later, his story was that there were nine glowing blue-white crescent-shaped lights flying in a V formation over Mount Rainier. In his humble yet expertly given opinion, the objects were moving at about 1,700 miles per hour. Okay. Remember, he's an amateur aviator, by the way. Yeah. He calculated this from the 42 seconds it took the objects to travel from Mount Rainier to Mount Adams, which is about 50 miles away. And this was nearly three times faster than aircraft were capable of traveling at the time and more than twice the speed of sound. So. That sounds pretty extraordinary. Yes, definitely. And also just, you know, the accuracy at which we judge distances when we're in a moving plane off the ground and where things are in relation to other things. We're not good at it. Yeah, probably not great. Probably we're not good at it back then. Now, very interesting tidbit here. One of the facts of the podcast for this episode, I think, is that when he described this and he was being reported on by a journalist, right? So he described that as the, their motion as a saucer view skipped across water. So here's his, his actual quote that he gave that was that we'll, we'll see transformed the way we think about the idea of UFOs for the rest of human history. So this is what he actually says, quote, these objects more or less fluttered like they were, oh, I'd say, boats on very rough water or very rough air of some type. And when I described how they flew, I said that they flew like they take a saucer and throw it across the water. Most of the newspapers mis misunderstood and misquoted that too. They said I had said that they were saucer-like. I said they flew like a saucer-like fashion, like in a saucer-like fashion, end quote. 
So interesting stuff because that has led to everything that we know about aliens and the way they're shaped. As he was describing their motion, not their shape, the newspaper report that told his story mistakenly described them as flying saucers. And the concept of disc shaped objects became permanently embedded in the world culture of UFOs. Now you hear saucers, but then you hear tic tac shape too. Sure. So you hear that now as well, but we'll talk about that later. Yeah. Maybe. Now, anyway, at first he reported thinking that it was a group of geese in flight. So he's trying to explain what it could have been. These supersonic <laughs> speed geese. <laughs> Radioactive geese. Yeah. <laughs> then he decided it must be the military performing some test maneuvers. However, when he asked, the military later reported they had not been conducting aircraft testing on that date at that location. And maybe it was the first instance of mutants. <laughs> and also, you know, we can definitely trust the military to tell us the truth about what they've been up to. That's what I was thinking. I was like, yeah, of course, the military is going to be transparent about that. Oh, yeah, actually, we were testing this. Yeah. And actually, I'm glad that military testing came up because that's a thing that's pretty recursive and ufology, ufology yeah. as well. Yeah. Now, later in 1947, W.W. Mac Brazel, which is arguably the most 1940s name I've ever heard, <laughs> happened upon 200 yards of strange flight wreckage in a now famous location, Roswell, New Mexico. Yep. Unlike anything he'd seen before. Brazel reported that he reported this, but was told that it was a weather balloon. What he was looking at was not a weather balloon. So I found this image of a sheriff, like holding some of the wreckage that Brazel or Brazel found and looking at it. I just, I imagine him picking up these pieces and saying, my God, these aliens use the exact same materials processed and manufactured in the exact same way as we do here on earth. Extraordinary fascinating <laughs> because you look at it and you're like it's paper and tin foils functional is mostly what seems to be there and i'm like so your rationale here is on another planet they just arrived through the exact same process we did at the exact same materials used for the exact same purpose that we use them for and that perfectly makes sense to you <laughs> okay right sure yeah sure 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 yeah and and honestly like when you look at the picture it looks like he's just holding insulation it that's, does. That's the way that it looks. Yeah. It looks like he pulled insulation out of a wall and it's like, like it, that's all it looks like. It's right. pretty, it's pretty interesting. Now the sighting of unidentified objects exploded into public consciousness and the idea of extraterrestrial visitors became a national phenomenon. I'd also like to point out too. It's really, I think the, the, the culture around this time was like really fascinated with sci-fi. Like you're talking about like some Good of the point. pulp scientific magazines and Isaac Asimov and all that stuff. There's a fascination with the future and all of that stuff at the time. So it makes sense that alien and extraterrestrial stuff would also look kind of crop up at that time. Now, what do we know about the term ufology that came to be known or used to refer to people who investigate these type of things? We're going to find out after this cliffhanger of a segue to an ad break so that you come back because I know that you would not otherwise come back to this episode after this ad break if I didn't set up a cliffhanger that way. That was my smooth as butter transition. All right. So let's talk about <laughs> the use of the term ufology. Or in some circles, when you talk to ufologists, they they call it ufology and not ufology, I've learned. I actually wonder if now that they've changed it to UAPs, if they call it uapology. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. If you're a ufologist or an unapologist or apologist, <laughs> let us know. You apologist. <laughs> let us know. You yeah. apologist. You apologist. <laughs> right in. So the earliest use of ufology or Ufology is a neologism of UFO and ology. Ology being the Greek word for study of. The earliest that we could find was in the science fiction magazine Fantastic Universe in 1957. This is not a recognized as a scientific or legitimate discipline by anyone except themselves, and even the, those optimistic scientists and philosophers who firmly believe there is intelligent life elsewhere in our universe and eagerly search for extraterrestrial life, or SETI, do not call themselves ufologists or ufologists yeah so the the group of people known as seti and there's like a seti research institute search for extraterrestrial life they're so actively committed to the idea of finding real evidence of other like extraterrestrial and intelligent life out in the universe they're not actually swayed or persuaded to follow this because it's not compelling. Like that's not there's not good evidence that that's been presented so far right and so they're like 
they really want to find the good evidence. And so for them, I'm sure it's probably a little frustrating to have like a constant flood of bad evidence that's distracting from the good evidence that might be out there. And so they tend to not uh, align themselves with the ufology or u- u- ufology crowd, whatever that is. Yeah, I mean, and statistically speaking, it makes sense that intelligent life may exist somewhere else in the universe, given that it's infinite. Yeah. So, like, it's possible, but, like, it's not likely that it's in our solar system. Right. Definitely not. And, you know, the other thing that is just difficult to wrap your head around is thinking about the great distance between our solar system and the next solar system that has, like, somewhat similar conditions for, like, planets to even potentially carry something that resembles life. Yeah. And then the... Thinking about like how long there's been intelligent life on this planet relative to the the age of the solar system and the galaxy and the universe is like the tiniest, tiniest blip. Yes. So it could have been that entire civilizations have existed, sent out probes for other life, died, decayed, and all remnants have since disappeared into the void before our planet even began to form. Yes. And so like... If there was other extraterrestrial life, the mathematical probability that it has existed, high, relatively speaking, I guess. The likelihood that it's existing right now with us, much lower. Much lower, yeah. And the likelihood that it has visited us, even lower than that. Yes, substantially. (laughs) Substantially, yeah. Distances and and space are no joke. I mean, you're talking about like having to survive enormous swaths like that we can't even wrap our heads around with basically no access to zero resources other than what you brought with you. Yes. No guarantee that you're going to survive once you get to the place you're trying to get to also uh, being constantly exposed to like radiation and the dangers of things in space. Like there's rogue planets floating out there that because space is black and they're not near any suns, you don't see them. You can't see them. They're just dark objects that have no, there are no reason to believe that you'd be able to detect that they were there. So if you're, let's say you're cruising around, I don't know, 80% the speed of light. Let's just be generous and say that that's possible. We don't think that it probably yeah. is, but let's just say that it is. You crash into a planet at going 80% of the speed of light. Your atoms will not remember that you were ever existed. <laughs> You'll be vaporized yeah. so completely. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, the universe is in constant flux and moving. Like, it, it, there's a lot, there's a lot of danger out there. So it's probably good. Let's just stay on this planet. It's fine here. All right. So, anyway, we got way off track. Let's, let's get back to what we were at. <laughs> So we were talking about the ufology. We're talking about the sightings in Roswell and all that sort of thing. Essentially, back in this time, when the 1940s, early 1950s, conspiracies immediately sprang up regarding the government hiding information about their knowledge of these incidents. And these weren't helped by the fact that in 1950s, bags of latex skin with aluminum bones were found strewn across the desert in New Mexico. (laughs) And they later admitted to lying about the wreckage that Brazel had found instead admitting that it was actually part of an espionage testing mission. And so there was lots of precedent for the government lying to people. And I don't remember if the MK ultra program was around this time or if it was a little after this, it was, it was right around this time. Okay. So like there's this history of the government doing shady things and lying to the public and like the public catching wind of it and then getting these bogus cover stories about it. So I can understand why there'd be some skepticism and conspiracy theories. There were some conspiracies. They weren't super well hidden, but they did exist. Yeah. I mean, all you got to do is look up Project Paperclip. That's all you got to do. So if you're not familiar with what that is, that's when the United States, after World War II, hired Nazi rocket scientists and engineers and, and a lot of like Nazi scientists to work with us and develop our space program. The Saturn rocket that got our people to the moon is part of Project Paperclip and was partially designed by Nazi scientists. Yeah. Yep. There's actually the show. There was a show called Hunters. I don't remember when it's supposed to take place. I want to say like the 1960s or 70s, maybe. But there is a bunch of people who are Jewish or of Jewish descent who are going around killing Nazis. And then they they basically invade the NASA program and start they take down a couple of the Nazis (laughs) that got flown to the United States to basically work for them. Yeah, it was a weird, a weird time. I think that's become increasingly well known in American history is that NASA hired a bunch of Nazis. Yeah. I mean, they don't anymore as far as I know, but that is the thing that happened. Yeah, glad we got better. Yeah. Glad nothing nefarious is happening now. Anyway. But it does explain some things about what happened in Florida and the current governor. Yeah, probably a direct descendant, I would imagine. Yeah, I think so. 
So let's talk a little bit about history, the history of, of UFOs, UAPs, and what that looks like. I think we can pivot a little bit and get away. Who, who'd have thought Nazis would have come up in an episode about aliens? You know, <laughs> who, who would have thought? I think that's probably pretty close because there was a lot of like supernatural and like esoteric research underneath the Nazi regime. So th- oh, it's probably true. not very far off. They did like the mysticism as well. You're right. We have some other unlikely cameos yeah. coming up soon, too. Can't wait. All right, so there have been centuries of people reporting UFOs or UAPs. According to a 2007 article in The Classic Journal, which sounds very official. I like it. Richard Stuthers suggested some sightings of aerial lights have been reported as far back as 233 BCE. Although, if you count the quote-unquote mystery of comets to earlier (laughs) human civilizations than as far back as at least 467 BCE, and likely even further back than that, because before there was a concept of a solar system and an atmosphere and space in general, pretty much everything that was ambiguous and particularly in the sky and in the in the ocean for that matter which we'll talk about cryptids at some point in the some, yes, we will. not too distant future these ambiguous things that they were seeing even venus at one point seen like on the horizon you know there's this bright star these were sort of uaps or ufos to these these people yeah absolutely so early people who reported these sightings did not necessarily think of them as being extraterrestrial. But they might have thought they were gods, demons, spirits, monsters, or the effects of starvation, dehydration, poison, or cocaine coursing through their veins. As Abraham mentioned before, we're going to talk about cryptids. I mean, the very idea of a thunderbird comes from, from indigenous peoples, and it's an aerial phenomenon that explains thunder and lightning. So it was kind of a cool thing. Sure. So th- this does exist. And they tended to describe those ambiguous phenomenon in terms of technology available at the time, which is consistent with human history in general. You can only describe a particular phenomenon with what you understand of the world at that time, with the language that's available at that time, with the technology that's available at that time. Yeah, exactly. So some people reported that objects were, again, were back in human history, they might have been shaped like their shields or shaped like their spears. Or they they reported these flying wagons in the sky, or they may have reported seeing flying horses in the sky, because, you know, that, that's what they were writing yeah. to get around. Or even gigantic bottle shape. The, uh, there was this really common shape of bottle that basically was ubiquitous. You could find it everywhere. And so they would see those. So basically, they would just project on ambiguous stimuli in the sky, whatever was sort of in the zeitgeist at the time and relevant to them, and particularly... If it was related to transportation, they would see their form of transportation. But again, it could have kind of been anything. It's relevant to whatever is relevant at at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. And then when sci-fi started to develop as a genre, largely in the 1800s, if you want to go back and read 1800 sci-fi, go do it. But just start with Frankenstein. That's the best one. That's the (laughs) the, just go there. Mary Shelley did a did a kick ass job of that. That was very good. Yeah. But all of a sudden, the idea of life from other planets seemed a plausible explanation. So people start talking about kind of like the, you know, stuff that's happening outside of, of our known universe. And they're like, oh, this would be cool if. Aliens and things came from other places and creatures. I'm reading Blood Meridian right now Hmm. by Cormac McCarthy. And I could see a lot of those guys kind of talk about like, oh, man, we don't want to deal with them. No, no no creatures there. Like I could see them (laughs) doing that out in the wild while they're starving and like bloodthirsty and all that. So fun. Yeah. Now, fun thing here, sort of another what feels like non sequitur side piece of information but dave grohl who i believe you recently read about <laughs> yes, yes 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 i like that you just go dave grohl yep we're talking about dave grohl now he was apparently at some point reading a ufo book i'm not totally clear why and he said as he was reading it there's a treasure trove of band names in ufo books and <laughs> The reason why is during World War II, the Axis and Allied pilots reported seeing these glowing fireballs, and without being able to explain what they were, for some reason they called them Foo Fighters. And yes, that is where the band got their name, is these glowing (laughs) fireballs reported during World War II. So great. That's my favorite cameo so far. Now, (laughs) after Kenneth Arnold's reporting of his experience in Washington and Brazel's report on the experience in New Mexico, people began reporting hundreds of sightings of UFOs. In 1948, the Air Force began Project Sign to investigate these claims, curious about what people were reporting. And this was supported in part by the Cold War effort 
to detect any Soviet aircraft or missiles. And so although they may not have been really in good faith trying to look for extraterrestrials, this did seem like a good opportunity to capitalize on the sort of national support and momentum to instead look for other things that were related to, again, what was going on at the time, which was the Cold War. Right, absolutely. And then in 1949, this became Project Grudge. And then in 1952, became Project Blue Book, headquartered out of Dayton, Ohio. If you, I, I recommend anybody, if you want to really understand Project Blue Book, it is a wild time for the United States, like research and development and espionage yeah. and all that stuff. It is bonkers what they tried to get away with. Like you're talking about like tainting town water to like make people hallucinate on LSD. That's like, you know, the um, MK ultra stuff. There's so many things that they did that you're just like the government funded a lot of stuff. And basically they just had like an unlimited cap. So project blue book is really interesting. And all of this stuff that we're talking about is looped into that. Yes, exactly. It just, it always comes back. (laughs) (laughs) It does. Now project blue book and these other projects, they investigated over 12,000 reports. And this is where we get part of our designation here because they classified each as either one identified, meaning that it was an astronomical, atmospheric, or artificial thing. So they're looking at these, these reports of these unidentified aerial phenomenon, or these aerial phenomena, let's just call them that. And they were either identified or, two, they were unidentified. That was basically the, the classification system. Yes. So what are these, these aerial phenomenon people are reporting? We either know or we don't know. Right. And about 94% of them were easily or at least eventually classified as identified. So the vast majority of these, almost every single one, 94 times out of 100, they could pinpoint what it was, no problem, and they were could confirm it with 100% confidence that they were right. But there was a 6% that lacked sufficient information or clarity to be conclusively identified as anything specific at all. They might have some ideas, and for many of them, they did. They're like, we think it's this, we just can't 100% conclude that it is. Yeah, sure. And then journalist writer Donald Kehoe took the Air Technical Intelligence Center report description of those flying objects in the unidentified category, which they called UFOB, or Unidentified Flying Objects, with the OB being from objects. OB. Yeah. That's how they, that's how they did that. Which just seems odd. Yeah. And then Keo coined the term UFO that we know and love today in his book, quote, flying saucers are real. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, a, what a what a great title for a book. I mean, that's like very, I like, uh, you know what you're getting into with a book like that. He cut right to the chase. You know, there's, there was no dancing around it. It's like, you know, it's the, this person dies at the end type <laughs> thing. So. Yeah, 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 exactly. I love it. I love it. Or like Avengers Endgame. You know, that's, right. that's the end. That's the end. The end. You got it. All right. Well, we're currently being abducted, so um, we're going to play some ads in the meantime, and we'll hopefully be able to claw our way out of the ship and come right back. We're back. I don't remember anything, but I see these notes in front of me, so I'm just going to keep reading. (laughs) The first thing that I see here is it says, technically, the UFO designation does not mean or even necessarily imply extraterrestrial. Sorry, we need we do need some context. Just to remind you, we were talking about the fact that these projects identified these aerial phenomenon as either identified or unidentified. But again, unidentified does not imply to them extraterrestrial. It just means we don't know what this is. It, we couldn't conclusively put a label on what it is. Right. A bird that was too high or fast that couldn't be conclusively confirmed as a bird would be labeled then as a UFO. That's an example of a thing they were dealing with. Right. Absolutely. By definition, if we can't identify it, it is a UFO. So uh, July 19th, 1952, another really great date that everybody remembers. Seven blips (laughs) appeared on the radar at the Washington National Airport. They deployed interception jets. They were going to cut them off, but then the blips disappeared. When the jets returned, the blips reappeared, moving at, quote, incredibly high speeds, end quote. Once again, the interception jets left and there was nothing to be found. This was all in the middle of the night, by the way. So so these these lights were these blips were really clear. And then the the official report hypothesized temperature fluctuations affecting the equipment. Uh, They never determined what the blips were or anything related to it. So they basically just said these blips happened. We couldn't find anything. I guess that's just. We're just going to leave it at that. Yeah. So there were some concerns happening around here. Also, by the 1950s, 
uh, flying saucer slash UFO enthusiast slash conspiracy theorist fan groups began to organize and pop up all over the United States and even form like national chapters of members that would sort of fuel the flame of interest in this topic further again, inspiring more work from the government to look into these things. Right. And so basically a lot of times what will happen here is these groups will take any sort of government involvement and funding to study it as confirmation that these exist. Right. Yeah, you're exactly right. The thing is, is UFOs exist. UFOs exist because by definition, they are unidentified flying objects or aerial phenomena. They, we know they exist. We just don't know what they are. Right. Just as an example, from 1966 to 1968, the Air Force sponsored the scientific study of these UFO, these phenomenon at the University of Colorado. So there is government funding at a university and you've got conspiracy theorists. They're going, see, I told you it's real. Why would they put money into it if it wasn't real? Yep, exactly right. So there are reasons they would do that. Um, they've put money into <laughs> things that weren't real before, yes. but <laughs> but here we are. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, of course, many people also claim to have been abducted by aliens, reports ranging from simply waking up in a different location, not knowing how they got there, to reporting, remembering details from the alien craft. There are a ton of people who have speculated what was going on, but almost every single one of these were people who likely had some mental health issues going on for them. Yes. So I just think there's more to investigate what's with them psychologically than uh, their report by itself. Yeah, absolutely. Now, similarly, instances of cattle mutilation, which we alluded to in the beginning of the episode, and that you would usually involve missing soft tissue, blood loss with no visible blood nearby, and surgical cuts are readily explained by scavengers, insects, and tears that occur when de- the decaying body bloats. So just as a reminder... We ask the question, what happens to a decaying body? And what is often reported is during sightings that there's cattle mutilation, stuff like that, that occurs with cattle around the area of the sighting. But all the things that happen with those, the decaying bodies is they can be explained with some kind of parsimonious explanation as a result of just the general process of decay. Yeah. And they'll insist that they're like, there were no scavengers, that sort of thing. And I'm like... They're pretty good at what they do. Like they're they're pretty good at hiding, getting in and out of there quickly. And and yeah, as we mentioned, they tend to like to go for the soft parts. They eat them fast. And so what people are reporting in these mutilated cattle were missing eyes, missing genitals, missing organs sometimes, and the soft parts. And they'd also report very few puncture wounds or any. And if there were cuts, then they looked like these very straight surgical cuts, which is exactly what happens when bodies bloat. They tend to split in a very straight line. Right. And so it looks very precise where the cuts occur and they are probably going to occur next to organs because let's face it most of our internal structure has has organs in it right particularly in the big fleshy parts you know right exactly yeah so it all like it all looks like you basically you can see a suspicious pattern but if you were to just come across an animal that died you more or less expect that exact same appearance to occur Right. It's a synchronicity. And that's a lot of times what happens. And we'll talk about this in the cryptids episode too that's coming up. But like the idea that people will fill in gaps, they'll fill in these gaps in knowledge when they don't have it or when there's not like evidence to the contrary. Right. So like we know this this process happens, but because this one event happened and the second event happened, we end up kind of relating these things. That's why we people believe the full moons are the reason why people do the wild things they do or Mercury and retrograde and all that. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Another one is crop circles. Now, these really caught people's attention as these mysterious patterns in large agricultural fields, such as wheat or corn. They looked like usually a perfect circle had been cleared from a field that looked like, how could someone do this? Why could someone do this? That sort of thing. Yeah. These were started as a hoax. The perpetrators even admitted to doing it and showed people how they did it. Yeah. But this picked up momentum from copycat pranksters and other people. Very straightforward. Basically, what you do is you you tie a rope to an anchor point in the middle of a field, and you walk around in a circle in the anchor point with your rope. The rope will knock down all of the plants in between you and the rope and create a perfect circle that is flat. And it looks like, I mean, we've, we already have flying saucers as an idea in the consciousness at this point. So it right. does. It looks like it shouldn't be there, and it shouldn't be there, but it is definitely human-caused, and they've definitely found that the people, <laughs> again, have admitted to this. 
it's really great geometry. Yes, it is. <laughs> like, it's just good math. I mean, like, there was, uh, I remember watching, because in the 90s, that was a big deal. Everybody was really all hung up on, like, all that stuff. I remember, like, sure. you know, you saw the 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 shows that were like, the, the moon landing was faked and all that. But the Crop Circles one, what they would do, too, is, like, they had that rope, but they would also, like, get a board or a plank. And they basically had these, like, rope handles that they would tie and help, like, push down oh, right. the crops. So they would, yep. like, help force it part. down so it, like, laid down more flat. Yeah, 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 you're right. I remember that. I, re- yeah. I forgot to mention that uh, I, when I was putting that part together. I I, uh, I forgot about that part, yeah. Yeah, it's good stuff. Now, the Department of Defense, or the DOD, also formed the Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Task Force, or the UAP, <laughs> that issued a <laughs> report from an investigation of claims involving U.S. government personnel and assets from 2004 to 2021. And this is a fairly new development. So this came out and everybody was like, yes! Aliens! And it's like, That's right. maybe not so much. So one of the things that we found in the report that was pretty common was, quote, unusual flight patterns. And we yeah. saw that time and time again. Some identified object, unusual flight patterns. That was kind of like people were going, see? See? And that's a lot of where the evidence is. That's where people are marking evidence for this type of thing. And that's the thing that most people look at and see, like, they feel like the best explanation then is extraterrestrial visitors when they see flight patterns that look like they shouldn't have those flight patterns. Sure. And actually, this seems like a good chance to take a quick side journey with you, Shane, because you had mentioned you saw aliens. Yes, I did see aliens. No, so I was <laughs> I was a kid, I was a teenager, and I was dating this girl, and we were in Florida. It's beautiful. Like, even in the summer, you can, like, lay out, and a lot of times the skies are really clear, so you can see quite a bit, you know, and it's it's really, really yeah. nice. So we were we were doing that romantic teenage stargazing thing. Nice. We were laying in our driveway, and we saw it looked like there was a shooting star, and it stopped and changed directions really quickly. And normally I'm like a pretty rational person. I'm like, I, and I, and at the time also, just to be clear, I was a straight edge kid. So I was very sober. Like I was actually probably too sober. I was going to ask if Tide Pods were involved somehow. They weren't even a, a, a glint in the eye of Tide at the time. Like we, they weren't even, yeah, they weren't even ready for Tide Pods. So I saw it and was able to confirm with the person I was with. And they went on to be a doctor. She went on to be a doctor and all that too. So she's a very rational person as well. So we both saw it, but neither of us went aliens. Both of us were like, huh? That was odd. Wonder what that was. And just kind of moved on from there. Like it was one of those things that stuck in my mind because it was so bizarre and so weird. And I never really could figure out like what a simple explanation for it was. But I never went so far as to be like, I'm a ufologist now. (laughs) You could. So that was the sliding doors moment in Shane's life where he could have gone one of two directions was hardcore conspiracy theorist (laughs) or like skeptical (laughs) doctorate level practitioner yeah so close i was right there it was that was the moment in a different timeline i'm on um ancient aliens <laughs> that's so. right yeah the alternate universe chain <laughs> making more money arguably probably so <laughs> yeah there's, there's that so so we were talking about the department of defense their their task force they've essentially investigated 144 reports and of those almost all lacked sufficient evidence to be labeled as anything However, there was an incident which for which they got a conclusive ID. So basically, they they had moved out of the just like every single report we're going to investigate to the ones that are the most ambiguous. So like, let's see if we can nail these down. And they just they were so. I mean, if they had images, they were incredibly fuzzy. It could have been anything. Videos were like barely a frame of anything that was again very fuzzy and ambiguous. A lot of them were just verbal reports that they couldn't link to anything. There was just way too little information. But they did get one. They nailed it. Like ah, this one we found it out wasn't an alien spaceship it was just a weather balloon but it was a thing that they were able to pin down from that ambiguous list of a hundred, of a dozen dozen things so funny it's like because it just comes back it all comes back it's all full circle it's all full crop circle that's right now there are other incidents <laughs> that involved not weather balloons but internet balloons and for a period of time google was testing a program to deliver free wi-fi by launching balloons with routers out into communities and so they were launching as many as hundreds per day so there were ample opportunities to spot one in some capacity somebody could have been like oh uh there's uh that's a thing that's a thing that happened there's uh there's a th- i think i don't know what it is it's like it's literally an internet balloon 
yeah, the internet balloon. So there was a sighting of this weird thing that was moving in the sky. It was obviously very far away. People could sort of just get just enough of a glimpse to determine that it was flying in what looked like a very odd flight pattern. And some people got a hold of it and they basically figured out where it took place, when it took place, saw that it mapped on with where Google is releasing these balloons and then did like a simulated flight path based on the weather that day for where it would have gone. And the image that they had basically mapped on nearly precisely with the flight, the simulated simulated flight path. So they're like, okay, that seems like a plausible explanation for what was going on here. Yeah. And then there's also, of course, been some very recent incidents involving pilots flying over bodies of water and along the coast. There is the the jetpack person who I don't think is being reported as an alien, but who's like was interrupting flights and out of LA <laughs> by flying with his yeah. weird Iron Man suit thing. These are all things that have sort of arisen and not, I don't think we get into this much later, but like some people have looked at the videos that have been reported by those people and looked at their claims and seen that they based the, I mean, just a little tiny bit of scrutiny and it all starts to fall apart. Right. So one of them, they're like, look at how fast this object is flying. And they're sort of like, look at where it is in relation to you in relation to the background. I'm like, essentially what you have is a small thing that's relatively close. That looks like a big thing. That's far away. If you put that big thing against the background, it looks like it's moving at thousands of miles an hour. But if you have it close, it's actually moving at about the same speed you are. And it's entirely possible. It's like a smudge on the lens. Even, (laughs) you know, like it could also just be a bird. Right. But then like the size of it isn't, uh, is actually very, very small. Whereas like they were making it look like, and the image, it was very large. And they're like, well, you're zoomed all the way in on it. So no, it's not large. And actually, it helps give you some perspective of the background, too. Yeah. So anyway, just things to note about that. So we're going to take a quick break. I've got a couple of the grays. If you're not familiar with them, the the big bulgy aliens that people talk uh-huh. about, they're knocking on my door and I got to see what they're up to. So uh-huh. I will be right back. Good luck. Let you know how it goes. OK, thanks. And uh, we're back. All they wanted were some Cheetos. Apparently, they're, f- they're fascinated with that. Fair enough. There's a fun board game called French Toast, and the premise is that aliens have visited Earth, and the first thing they encountered was French Toast. And so whenever they go back to their home world <laughs> and they bring new artifacts, people always ask, is it like French Toast? It's a very <laughs> silly concept, but it's, it's, it makes for a very fun game. So uh, bonus recommend. Yeah, I like that. Uh, if you read Animorphs, the one alien likes um, Cinnabon buns whenever he morphs into a human he goes crazy and gets addicted to it at the end of the book they open up cinnabon franchises on the andalite homeworld because they're (laughs) so good and they do andalite tourism where they come to earth and they morph humans just so they can eat the food here wow so apparently they decided to also adopt our currency on their planet so that it would be lucrative for (laughs) cinnabon to do that (laughs) yeah 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 Yeah, on the andalite homeworld they use american dollars (laughs) Hard for me to imagine also going to an alien <laughs> planet and being like, I'm going to go and eat that food right there. That should be fine. I got a yeah. problem with that. Yeah. But, yeah. It's not going to mess up my system at all. Yeah. Not worried about like allergies are not a thing that I worry about. Yeah. I'm sure this doesn't contain bacteria I've never experienced. Yeah. There are things on planet like like people die from peanuts. I'm going to go to a home, a different world and then try to experience something. No, thanks. Like I'm, yeah. I'm that's it. This is more arguments to stay on this planet and not go anywhere. Yeah, exactly. But what we're actually talking about, despite our <laughs> awesome, awesome tirade there, is why people <laughs> believe in UFOs and UAPs as being extraterrestrial objects, I guess. So that's a question we've got to ask is why do people believe it? And, and imagine you, one, lack of foundation in critical thinking, two, want to believe there are aliens visiting our world, three, are gullible as all get out, and four, are told that you've been clued into a secret group of enlightened few who know the truth. And once you have that context, everything you see in the sky that is even remotely ambiguous seems a good, if not perfect, candidate to be a UAP. Everything that seems odd or counterintuitive uh, seems to be best explained by aliens. And you become so primed to see aliens that the, quote, evidence becomes overwhelming. Yeah, you see it in everything you do. It's, you know, sort of like people when they have been at their job for a long time, they see the world through the lens of their profession. Yeah. And they just see, you know, the the world is the thing that they do for their job. And it's just because we spend a lot of time around it. And if, if your job is hunting for UFOs, everything becomes a UFO. Yeah. 
I mean, we do that. We're behaviorists. And so we end up in a space where we talk about from a behavioral lens all the time. And we actively work against that to make sure that we do provide a different viewpoint. But we can't help but do that because we're scientists. Yeah. We come at everything from a scientific perspective. Exactly. As far as why people believe with respect to how many people believe, there was a 1947 Gallup poll that found that 29% of people asked thought that the UFO sightings that were being reported were just a mistake. 15% thought they were military weapons, and 33% simply said they didn't know. Now, the believers were probably not 33% because those were their only options. Sure. There is like a mistake, military weapons, or I don't know. They're like, well, it was aliens, so I guess I don't know. Yeah, right. Now, a 1952 Dutch poll was similar, except that, one, there was no support for extraterrestrials as the answer, and two... 43% said they didn't even know what a UFO was. So it just was not part of the dialogue that was happening over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fun, fun stuff. Now, from 2019 to 2021, Gallup saw American people reporting that the explanation from sightings might be from UFOs increase from 33 to 41 percent. And the belief that they are due to human activity decrease from 60 to 50 percent. Yeah, that's sure. That checks out, I guess. Yeah, that sounds about right. How (laughs) things have been going. So, from an article published on sciencefocus.com, mid-2022, assistant professor of psychology at North Dakota State University, go Bisons, <laughs> Andrew Abeta, I'm guessing is how you say that name, he was reporting some research looking at characteristics of people who believe in, in aliens as explanations for these things. And what he found was a negative correlation between religion and alien belief, which was kind of interesting. So essentially, huh. he, he attributes this to either one filling the need for meaning and purpose, meaning that essentially if people ha- like needed to believe in something, they tended to be religious – or if they didn't find what they were looking for in religion, then but they still needed to believe in something, they would instead believe in aliens as the explanation for things. Sure. Now, what's contradictory about this is research out of the University of Freiburg, Freiburg maybe, found that there was a positive correlation with literal interpretations of religion rather than simply spiritual sense of purpose and a tendency to believe in conspiracies, including aliens. So instead, they were correlated together. Regardless, belief of the fantastical altogether, whether it be aliens or religious, was negatively correlated with education, meaning that the more educated people were, the less likely they were to believe in aliens, the less likely they were to be religious. Interesting stuff. Now, another correlation exists between reported belief in aliens in times of turmoil, frustration, or an uncertainty. So, uh, you know, right now we're primed for everybody to believe in aliens. <laughs> it can help people feel better and provide a sense of escapism to embrace mystical explanations rather than face the depressing reality of their or our situations. And if that's the case, as our country's democracy is on the verge of collapsing and people are openly supporting tyrannical dictator regimes, after a four-year assault on science, critical thinking, and intelligence in general, after a once-in-a-century plague shook our civilization to its core, I'd say we are more than ripe for some ufology to rocket to new levels of popularity. Absolutely makes sense. That is where we're at. That's where we're at. I mean, overlay that with what's going on or what happened during World War II and what happened right after, right? So mm. I mentioned earlier Good that the, the rise in science fiction came around that time. Really, truly, you saw a big burst in that and the idea of futurism and stuff like that. And so it makes sense that at the time of like one of the most difficult periods of of at least the modern times it makes sense that science fiction would start to crop up in that space yeah absolutely it's a good point too yeah the i was thinking about world war ii laying you know fairly similar timeline as the these first sightings talking about ufos i mean world war ii has only been over for a couple of years at this point right and you know we're not too far away from heading into another war also so yeah in the united states specifically so yeah you're right yeah now science has also already said that life on planets is not only plausible, but at this point, mathematically probable. Intelligent life, we don't know. Possibly zero. As we mentioned earlier, like there are like millions and millions of planets, possibly billions, that are in a habitable zone of a planet. Most of them are hundreds of thousands of light years away. And like, I don't know if we appreciate the distance of a light year, but it is so far that a human lifetime would not survive the trip. (laughs) It is very, very, very far 
Right. And like, we're not even a single light year away from the next closest star, let alone the next closest star that has a planet in the habitable zone. Right. We could be, I don't remember the exact numbers. Somebody's probably going to want to write in and correct, but I feel like we're on the verge of like a hundred light years away, possibly less than that, like 50. I don't know. But like, we're still talking about like way more than the span of a human lifetime to get there. By the time that you arrived at that destination, it's possible the human species would be gone. <laughs> like that's how yeah. far, assuming like you could like do the cryo sleep thing. Like it's such a tremendous, tremendous distance. So anyway, there are a lot of candidates that make it possible. It's possible that they have come and gone. It's possible that we're early and that many, many more will come after us. Yeah. We don't know, but it seems like the intelligent life that's out there is definitely on the lower end of just life in general. So just something mm-hmm. to consider. Yeah, just as a, I, I looked it up while you were talking about that. So the next closest star is Proxima Centauri, and it is 4.24 light years away. Okay. Now, if you're not sure what that means as far as like distance that we understand, a light year is 9.44 trillion kilometers or 5.88 trillion miles. Okay. That is a huge distance. So, so if you wanted to, let's say today you decided to walk to Proxima Centauri, it would only take you 950 million years to get there. <laughs> That's all. It would almost take you a billion years to walk to the nearest star. So, you know, it's a little bit of a distance. Yeah. I'm a slow walker and you got to take breaks too. And also there's no oxygen in space. So you're not going to be able to do it. Even if we were traveling at the speed of light, which again, we think is not possible, but let's assume that we were, let's assume that we could get from point A to point B safely. That is four and a half years aboard the spaceship that you're traveling. And you've got to consider you can't jump from zero to speed of light. You've got to accelerate. And at some point you have to begin to decelerate and the force of gravity on your body during that acceleration and deceleration is actually the thing that will kill you If you don't do it very carefully, if you accelerate too quickly, you are putting, you know, two, three, four, 20, 50 times the force of gravity on your body, you will be crushed under the weight of your own body. Like you just can't go that fast. Similarly, if you do the thing like in Star Wars, where your ship that's traveling at the speed of light comes to a sudden stop, the ship may have stopped. Your body did not. It is still traveling at the speed of light. And again, it will hit the front of that ship with such fantastic speed that vapor would be too big a mass for what would be left of you. <laughs> <laughs> all, all I got to say is prove it. Just say it hasn't happened yet. Just prove it. Yeah. Prove us wrong. I know, you know, but you're right. It's like the, the basic physics of it doesn't make any sense right now in the world that we live in. Yeah. I mean, quantum physicists will be like, actually, and I'm like, well, that's not a real science because you all are so much smarter than everybody. So nobody understands quantum physics. So that's a whole thing. We should do an episode on quantum physics and then just like have our brains bleed out of our heads when we try to describe <laughs> it. Because it's, it's the, the most precipitous dip in listenership ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah, watch watch what happens there. So we talked about this before, but the more recent activity from the government in investigating these types of events, while driven by many highly credulous politicians, is also a chance for the government to pivot on UFOs. Specifically, UFOs that are constructed objects are likely sightings of secret reconnaissance technology from foreign countries. That's that's a more plausible explanation for what's going on. Yeah. The scientific community and government has tried to shift away from dismissing or disregarding reports of sightings because it can prevent people from coming forward to communicate information. Makes sense if it gets punished all the time or we don't re- like actually like hear people and they're going to stop reporting it. Right. What can happen is it'll prevent those people from coming forward and it might prevent us from getting information that might be valuable to government intelligence agencies. So essentially... If more people report and then they aren't heard or they're mocked or made fun of, information that might be useful could get lost in the fray. Exactly right. Yeah, is that they're like, actually, we probably do want people reporting these things because they might actually yield something that we do need. Yeah. Now, as we mentioned, many of the most enthusiastic dreamers who want there to be alien life and for us to discover those aliens in their lifetime are also some of the most skeptical. They will not settle for these fuzzy, ambiguous maybes. They understandably want solid proof. And and I was preparing the notes for these. There was maybe one source that I found that did not have this very, very standard image of a picture from a, fl- a plane that was in flight of some object on the screen that they don't know what it is. And it's clear there's an object there. It's got kind of a weird egg shape, sort of. Or like a peanut, peanut, maybe. Yeah. Anyway, this is referred to as the gimbal video because it was shot on a gimbal camel that was mounted on a gimbal on this plane. 
And yeah, there's this video, this picture is all over the place. If you Google UFO, you will see this image. It's like the the smoking gun, sure. if you will, about this. A couple things to know about this video. One, it was shot at night. The pilots couldn't actually see it. They were basically seeing it through the camera because it was too dark for them to see out the windows. Two, this is a thermal camera that is on something called a rolling gimbal. A uh, rolling gimbal basically makes it so that the camera rolls with the plane to keep the image as stationary as possible as it's snapping them. But what it does do is it also then forces the image to rotate somewhat as it's adjusting its position. And so what that makes the the object the image look like it's doing is doing a slight wobble slash tremor, which is part of what they reported it doing. Also, there is 20 seconds with commentary from the pilots on this, specifically giving it all these titles. It may have never amounted to anything, except they decided to have this commentary. And then finally, this was published in a New York Times article, which gained it all this enormous popularity. Because again, presumably things like this happen all the time. They're not anything. They don't matter. Nobody cares, except this one time that it just happens to and became like the crux of the thing. So in all likelihood, it may have been something it may have been a bird it may have been a balloon who knows what it was but it was very unlikely that it was an alien spaceship and all of the movement of the object in the video that is collected the movement can be attributed to the properties of the camera that was used yeah absolutely and that leads to another part of this which is that the governments that are usually involved in reporting or, or kind of recording this stuff they want people to believe in ufos and they want people to have kind of like that that wild imagination around it because a lot of times what happens is there is new technology, there are new weapons, they want to keep that secret. And so testing weapons on planes that they don't want to be known, they don't want known to foreign adversaries or to the public, it's it's a good look to be like, oh, well, we don't know what that is. It could be something, some, we just don't know. And, and having kind of having people kind of guessing at what this is, one, deflects away from the government right. quite a bit. But two, it it allows people to kind of come up with their own conclusions and muddies the waters around the communications. I mean, that's like a basic kind of tactic that you'll see governments use is basic communications disruption and like misinformation campaigns. Right. So people create their own misinformation campaigns once they they identify this might be a a UAP, a UFO or something that's extraterrestrial. You can imagine how convenient it is. You're testing something that you don't want people to know about. They spot it and they're like, oh, that might be aliens. And the government's like, that's. A good idea. Yes. yes, it might be aliens. <laughs> that's way better than the actual real yes. thing that's happening. <laughs> the other thing that could be happening is that uh, allowing people to believe in the shroud of mystery can sort of keep people needing the government to be there to protect them and do something about things like this. So it's like, again, having people believe in UFOs, it actually could be practically useful for a government. Sure. To a point. Again, I feel like it's a little short sighted, but there are some immediate benefits that they might glean from that. So before we get into the last little bit and some take home points, we're going to go ahead and do a little bit of sighting practice. We're going to go look at the sky and see if we can find some UFOs that are not birds. I'm going to get my binoculars. Yes, we need binoculars, telescopes or whatever it is that you use to find those UFOs. So while we do that and report back to you, enjoy these breaks. Well, clear skies on my end. Yep. I did see a cloud that looked like John Stamos, but uh, otherwise, <laughs> nothing unique up there. Yeah, I saw a weird bird, but it's Florida, so it could be anything. <laughs> True. Florida is the place of aliens. <laughs> You're so used yes, to basically yes, everything is an alien. You're so used to seeing it that at this point, it doesn't even register. We're just like, yeah, that could be an alligator. It could be an alien. Who knows? <laughs> All right, we do have some other interesting tidbits. Sort of talking throughout history, lots of official and identified objects have been reported as UFOs. As I mentioned earlier, Venus is bright and can look suspicious when near the horizon. That's been reported as a UFO. A parachute team once was mistaken for a UFO. Rockets that have been fired have been mistaken as UFOs or UAPs again. Drones, man, drones are everyone now. And drones have caused yep. several instances of thinking that they were potentially UFOs or UAPs. And one that I thought was really fun is this one UK resident actually called the police to report a bright object lingering near his home. And when they went to investigate, they discovered that that bright object was in fact the moon. It was not near his home. <laughs> But it was in the sky, visible from oh, his home. Oh, yeah, not even close. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not even close to his home. Yeah. You know, the thing is, is that when we start looking at this and you start really getting into it, a lot of times, and this is kind of what happens with conspiracy theories, is when you start asking questions, a lot of the kind of the, the premises fall apart. Yeah. So we do have questions. We do have questions. Why stay in the sky? Yeah. Why would aliens who are visiting our world just hover around in the sky? Why wouldn't they just land and explore things? It would take so much energy to just be constantly in the sky moving around trying to do that. Another one is like, we have had this explosion and the proliferation of camera technology. Like there's so many cameras that you can basically assume that if you're around other people or man-made structures, you're probably being watched by a camera at any given point. Right. So why don't we see better videos, better images and better capture of these things? If they do exist now that we're monitoring everything constantly that like we should be able to see them. Right. Absolutely. And another question is, how would they know to evade our detection and why would they want to evade our detection? I mean, is this like a if this is an extraterrestrial, why are they moving away from us? Like, why are they keeping themselves secret? Yeah. The big question that I have is why? Imagine we went we were visiting another alien society. We wanted to like maybe try and be discreet. I'm like, we don't really know what's going on here. We don't know if they'll be hostile. We want to like keep ourselves hidden. How would we know what technology they have to monitor their air, their skies that we would know how to evade it well enough to stay hidden? Right. And likewise, how would others know that about us? Like, there's just there's no way they couldn't possibly begin to predict ways that we would be monitoring our skies for things for them to be able to hide themselves well enough. Right. And then again, why evade detection? Unless. At all? Now, <laughs> it's just it's just the technology. Oh, unless they maybe <laughs> gave us our technology. Unless their time travelers are not actually aliens. Oh, mm. they're for us There's, from the future. That's oh my god. There's so so this is I I really like like reading into this stuff and seeing what people believe. One of my favorite things is that uh like UFOs are actually not from another planet, they're from another dimension or from another time. So like they're time travelers or they're cross-dimensional, not necessarily extra like from extraterrestrial. That would suggest that they're humans from either another dimension or from a from a future timeline, so they would know what our technology is. Oh man, it's so good. I love I love uh, imaginations. Yes, that is that would be very fun. <laughs> so okay, barring that as the hypothesis. Yeah. yeah, and as you said, sort of why why bother trying to evade our detection at all? Of course, there might be some fear of like hostility and that sort of thing. But again, how would they even know we were intelligent? Like our best guess is that if we were to land on a planet that had life, that there wouldn't be intelligent life. That would be our best guess, right? Right. And so assuming that we would immediately be in hostile and be in danger seems like a bit of a leap. And so I don't think it'd be reasonable to expect that that would that they would expect that of us either. And then also like why hide it from people? Why would the government hide it from people? And also how and like how would they like if an alien were to come to visit they they're not going to know. Oh, that's the government. Let's go talk to them first and see if we should remain hidden. There's just gonna be like there seems to be life here. Let's go check it out. You know, the likelihood of them ending up at some official place where they can then stay hidden seems like vastly implausible to say the most about it. I mean, I think at the end of the day, like those, those are just some basic skeptics questions that we would have. But I think, I think, you know, I go back and I'm kind of like, you know, uh, why would they even want to study us to begin with? Because we're a mess. That's, that's the big question I have. We're a mess. Not just why, but why bother? Yeah. Have you seen us? <laughs> the same reason people watch the bachelor. Or, the <laughs> <laughs> or bling kingdom or whatever it is like uh, there's yep. some new show that people are like all about and i'm like i can't i can't do it the morbid curiosity i guess no nah, yeah it's a whole thing all right uh let's hit some take-home points really quick this is not to disparage those who want to believe that there are ufos and uaps and that sort of thing that are real that are out there and honestly i mean technically speaking there are unidentified aerial phenomena that are out there they're very unlikely to be extraterrestrials but there are things that we don't know what they are those exist what i wanted to talk about was the history and sort of bring the skeptical lens to thinking about this a little bit yeah and i think another thing too is i, I you know a lot of this is anecdotal reports and uh, and people yeah. kind of reporting their own experiences and it's certainly one of those things that you don't want to disparage somebody's experience like you can't argue and that's a that's a big part of it is like you can't really argue what somebody thinks they saw or what their experience is like you can't argue against that you can try to explain it but that's why people get really stuck in that too if they've had an experience they're like i felt this i saw this i experienced this it was very real to me and so you've got this issue of their experience was real to them but it can be partially explained by some other phenomenon with more information right the other thing to maybe take home point is just sort of 
I don't know. I, I like I like all the history stuff. So thinking about this in terms of like people seeing it through the lens of what was relevant for them at the time, I feel like a very revealing point in here is the fact that the idea of it being a disc shaped flying object was just a misquote from a journalist yep. that has become the thing that we see and is literally the depiction of pretty much every version of a spaceship that is like comes across science fiction yeah is this this sort of disc shaped uh saucer thing if you look at like mars attacks like they were actually in just like these spinning discs <laughs> that was the whole yeah. thing yeah with like a little glass bubble on the top yeah exactly and even independence day the big ships were mostly giant discs like it's yeah those are the i don't know it i i feel like that fact the fact that we basically made a mistake in our reporting and then they saw those everywhere is very illuminating in the fact that we just primed ourselves to see that thing and then saw it and that was it exactly I, that, that's 100 percent the thing and i think that the, my, my big my last take on point is that it comes down to parsimony for me Right. It comes down to Occam's razor, where it's like the simplest explanation makes the most sense most of the time. And it does not make sense that terrestrials from another planet, extraterrestrials would come from another planet and come observe us when it's more likely that somebody's testing some weird drone or it's military testing or there's some kind of earthly explanation for what they might be seeing. Like it makes way more sense to explain it that way than to make these like big, large leaps in logic to be able to get to a point where, hey, there's an alien, there's there are aliens, and I know because this unidentified flying object came to my planet. And I think, you know, I'm I'm among those. I would love it to be the case if we did get to discover intelligent life in my lifetime. Yeah. Um, and so I'm like, I'm eager for that evidence to exist. So I hope that, I hope yeah. that we, we do find it. I want to believe. Exactly, yeah. I'm unwilling to accept spurious evidence and unsubstantiated claims. I think that's the perfect take home point for this. Perfect. Let's then recommend some things. Woohoo! Recommendations. All right. I am recommending a TV show. A little bit of a caveat because the first season has not fully finished streaming at the time that we're recording this. And this is the TV show The Patient, with primarily starring almost exclusively Steve Carell and Domino Gleason. And the general premise of the show without giving away too much is that there is a serial killer who wants to stop being a serial killer. And so he kidnaps a therapist to try and force him to cure him of his impulse to kill people. Yes. And that's the, the crux of the, the rest of what happens is that dynamic and the acting in it is phenomenal. The writing is good. I think it's a really, really good show. I think most people will enjoy it. The episodes are fairly short. I think they're like the 20 to 30 minute mark for most of them. I can't recall what platform this is on. I, I know that they're streaming on Hulu, but I think it maybe is originally on FX. That sounds about right. Yeah. So I, I, anyway, check out the patient. If you're into that sort of thing, I think it's a, it's a particularly the acting very, very good in the show. Yeah. 100%. I'm so stoked to check it out. I'm going to recommend a tattoo shop. Okay. I might've recommended them before, but I recently got tattooed. I love this place. They've always been really good to me. They're called rise above tattoo and they are in Orlando, Florida. Nice. The thing about tattoo shops is, is a lot of times, like every tattoo shop has a culture and I'm big on like feeling comfortable in a place where I'm permanently inking my skin. And uh, this place is like kind of a, it's a bunch of like art punks. Mm -hmm. It's not like a biker shop. It's not like a, you know, like a mass produced, like, you know, it's not one of those things. It's, it's a place that does really good traditional work, really good clean work the shop is a lot of fun it's quiet it's small so there's not like 15 tattoo guns going at the same time and i went and got tattooed by a guy named von toma and he did some really cool traditional work on me so i i strongly recommend the shop rad okay good to know yeah those people in uh orlando i got my elbow tattooed it sucked oh is that your new one is your elbow on the inside of my elbow and it made me it made me want to die so <laughs> fun because i have my other elbow tattooed and i was like man i remember that sucking so much when i did it the first time and then he did this one i was like oh right 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 right, right. yeah worst, i need to remember it again <laughs> yeah. i forgot what this is like remind me awesome all right well this is run a little long so let's go ahead and wrap up here by saying thank you if you would like to see shane's tattoo we have a video of us recording this he holds his tattoo up to the camera you could do that by joining us <laughs> he's modeling it now you could do that by joining us on patreon 
and doing so, depending at the tier at which you join, you'll have access to behind the scenes videos of us recording, which come with a whole bunch of bonus <laughs> nonsense that's very fun. Uh, you also <laughs> get early access to episodes and ad free episodes, and you can even get our notes if you'd like to sign up at that level. And there's levels above that. And the people who have already made that commitment and already enjoying these benefits include amanda brad the daily ba joshua justin justine kelly kim costia layla megan mike m mike t shauna and stephanie thank you all so much for continuing to support us and doing what we do you are awesome and we appreciate you a ton. Yes, 100%. Also, my team of people who help make this podcast happen includes Justin, Selena, Kyle, Alan, Jess, Patrick. Again, congratulations to Alan. has got a, a new family member. Yay! And of course, thank you so much to you, Shane, for recording with me and all that you bring to the table. That's just great. Well, thank you so much. It's always great to be here. Thanks. Yeah. The thing that I, I always need to remind you of is that you can support the show by leaving us a rating and a review, subscribing, telling a friend. You can also pick up some merch at our website. And if you would like to learn more about this and other topics, you can go to our website and that sort of thing that we have done. And I feel like I'm maybe forgetting some other piece of thing that you can do. Is there anything that stands out to you? Review. Join the Patreon share with your friends do all the cool things buy stickers buy merch all that stuff too yeah maybe get get like an initiative on a uh, a ballot in your local election that they they mandatorily stream episodes of our podcast uh, every week on public mm-hmm. radio yeah or just vote for us as the as the elected official like yeah. we can be like put wwd podcast as the the elected official yeah there you go the, we'll <laughs> the make podcast. policies in your area <laughs> should work sounds perfectly yeah. legal yeah all right well and uh, if that's if there's nothing else then i think that's all that i have uh, this is abraham this is shane we're out see ya you've been listening to why we do what we do you can learn more about this and other episodes by going to www.podcast.com thanks for listening and we hope you have an awesome day